Hello, this is Russ and Kitty Walden with Father's Heart Ministry, and this is the Morning Light Daily Bible Study, where we go through the Bible chapter by chapter and give you your whole Bible back. Now, the Kitty part's not with us today, but we are studying Mark 4. What kind of ground are you? In Mark 4, Jesus introduces and then expounds the parable of the sower. In this teaching, Jesus makes it clear that the word once sown in your heart will identify the quality of soil that your heart constitutes. What kind of ground are you? Are you good ground? Are you really? This teaching will help you move from little victory in Christ to 30, 60, and a hundredfold blessing. Let's begin by reading Mark chapter 4 in its entirety. And Jesus began again to teach by the seaside. And there was gathered unto him a great multitude, so that he entered into a ship and sat in the sea. And the whole of the multitude was by the sea on the land. And he taught them many things by parables, and said unto them in his doctrine, Hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow, and it came to pass as he sowed. Some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. And some fell on stony ground, where it had not much earth. And immediately it sprang up, because it had no depth of earth. And when the sun was up, it was scorched, because it had no root, and it withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. And other fell on good ground, and did yield that uh, fruit that sprang up and increased, and brought forth some thirty, some sixty, and some a hundredfold. And he said unto them, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was alone, they that were about him with the twelve asked of him the parable. And he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables. That seeing you may see and not perceive, and hearing you may hear and not understand. Lest at any time they should be converted, and their sins should be forgiven them. And he said unto them, Know ye not this parable? And how shall you know all parables? The sower, he goes on to describe it now, the sower sows the word. And these are they by the wayside where the word is sown, but when they have heard, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. And these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness, and have no root in themselves, and so endure but for a time afterward when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. And these are they that are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things entering in, choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. And these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word, and receive it, and bring forth fruit, some thirty, some sixty, and some a hundred. And he said unto them, Is a candle brought to be put under a bushel or under a bed, and not to be set on a candlestick? For there is nothing hid which shall not be made manifest, neither anything kept secret that it should not come abroad. If any man has ears to hear, let him hear. And he said unto them, Take heed what you hear. With what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you. And unto you that hear shall more be given. For he that has, to him shall be given. And he that has not, from him shall be taken even that which he has. And he said, So is the kingdom of God, as if a man should cast seed into the ground, and should sleep and rise night and day, and it should spring up, he knows not how. Just have the faith to go to bed and get up. That's what Jesus is saying. For the earth brings forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. And he said, Whereunto shall we liken the kingdom of God, or with what comparison shall we compare it? 
It is like a grain of mustard seed, which, when it is sown in the earth, is less than all the seeds that be in the earth. But when it is sown, it grows up and becomes greater than all the herbs, then shooteth out great branches, so that the fowls of the air may lodge under the shadow of it. And with many such parables spake he the word unto them as they were able to hear it. But without a parable, very important, without a parable spake he not unto them. But when they were alone, he expounded all things to his disciples. And the same day when evening was come, he said unto them, Let us pass over to the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship, and there were also with him little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat upon the ship, so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and said, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? So let's go back to the beginning of our chapter. In chapter 4 of Mark, we find Jesus continues teaching by the seaside after leaving the synagogue in Capernaum, where he was confronted by the scribes and the Pharisees and accused, can you imagine, of casting out devils by Beelzebub. The crowds continue to swell, so he uses a ship near the shore as a platform and begins teaching several parables of the kingdom of God. Here we find the beginning in verse 4, the parable of the sower. The teaching in this parable compares the heart of man to soil in which the good news of the gospel has been planted. In verse 11, the disciples come to Jesus and they ask him to expound the lesson because they don't fully understand. Now, this is where you see the difference between a disciple and a mere follower because the disciples are pressing the inquiry rather than, strugg than just struggling with what's being said, shrugging their shoulders in disinterest. Jesus tells them that it is given unto them to know the mystery of God, but those who don't understand, it is not given to know. Well, no, none of them understood at first, but then the disciples, here's where the difference is made, they came and asked him for an explanation. The ones that didn't understand and didn't care enough to have an explanation, they were excluded. So this tells us something very important. Though the kingdom is admittedly mysterious, as Jesus himself states, it can be known by those who care to make the inquiry beyond just casual listening. We also know that the parable of the sower is not only about the heart of man, but about the kingdom of God. So what is the connection here? In Luke 17, 20 and 21, Jesus states that the kingdom of God is within your heart. Therefore, when teaching a parable with the heart of man as the subject, it is also in Jesus' view a teaching of the kingdom of God that is found in Jesus' perspective in none other than the human heart. When Jesus thinks of the kingdom, he thinks of the human heart because that's where he put the kingdom. Now, when the word of the gospel is sown into the heart, there are several possible outcomes determined by the condition of the life of the hearer and the quality of their motivation to actually listen to what's being actually conveyed. Number one, the seed can fall where? On the wayside, where Jesus said the birds come and simply carry it away to be devoured. Number two, the seed can fall on stony ground, where it remains, but is dried up. You ever hear something, hear a dry sermon? It's dried up and it's scorched by the sun because uh, the stony condition of the ground keeps it from germinating and putting down roots. Number three, 
the seed can fall onto thorny ground where it germinates and takes root but is choked out by the weeds and the thistles. Number four, the seed can fall into good ground where it produces, and it produces varying degrees of yield, some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. Somebody said, I'll take 100 fold. In expounding the parable, Jesus tells us that the seed by the wayside is the seed that is immediately stolen away from the hearts of the hearers by the adversary. Who's the adversary? Satan himself. Have you ever seen the enemy at work at the time a message is being given? It's amazing that we could sit through a two-hour movie at the theater and afterward repeat the entire story, but even a brief 30-minute sermon is in danger, in danger of what? Of being regarded as a total snore, even by some of the most faithful church attenders, even in the midst of of the congregation. You never see children. Isn't it interesting? You never see children so capable of distracting adults near them by their adorable behaviors as you do in a church service. That's the enemy at work. Mothers would never allow that to happen in a place of business or in the bank or the hospital or in the movie theater. But in church, it's acceptable for kids to cut up like that while the word of God is being given. Whole Programs of the church are geared and intended to what? Take children and the young away from the preaching of the Word of God. And we wonder why children don't stay in the church when they get older. It's a foregone conclusion that the Word preached in the adult service, oh, that's not going to benefit the very young. Where does this idea come from? If not, from the enemy. If not, from a decidedly prejudiced opinion of adults in church against the quality of what's being taught. Oh, them kids won't get nothing out of that. Our church culture is deeply contaminated by satanic strategies to marginalize and downplay the importance and vitality of preaching of the Word of God. And so it becomes what? The seed sown by the wayside, seed sown into the lives of of those who think they have something more important, more entertaining to do. That's the word that would likewise benefit them and bring them to breakthrough is stolen. Don't let this happen to you. Don't let it happen to your children. Now, what can we learn from the word sown on the stony ground? Jesus said these are those who receive the word Gladly, unlike those in the previous example, they're just bored, but they have no root, no depth of character. Their relationship with God is a mile wide and a half inch deep. They have an emotional affection for the things of God, but when persecution comes, that what happens, they are offended. Now, that is what a stone represents in the Bible, offense. In Psalm 119, 165, the psalmist declares this. Listen. Great peace have they who love thy law. They shall in nothing be offended. Are you offendable? Then judging by the testimony of God's word, you can only conclude that you don't love the word of God. You don't love the law of God. Because he said in Psalm 119 that if you love the law of God, the word of God, you're not offendable. If you don't love the word of God, you're not going to hold up under the pressures of life. And that's what Jesus is explaining about the stony ground. Now, what about the thorny ground? Here we find those who receive the word gladly have root in themselves. That is a commitment to endure, but life intervenes. Not so much by sudden calamity, but by the insidious and draining demand of daily things dampening the fullness of the word of God sown into the heart until the thorny ground hearer is so preoccupied and distracted they have little more than just an insipid dishwater religion for all the dreariness of life that has conspired to contaminate their testimony. So their lives look little different than those of the unbelieving world around them. Talking about the cares of life, the deceitfulness of riches. And uh, finally, we have some hope. We come to the good ground. 
which is the heart that gladly hears the word, that refuses to be offended when challenges come, that the word puts down deep tap roots and the ground of the heart is assiduously cleared by a ruthless discipline against worry, fear, and the cares of life, this heart bears fruit. Is that your heart? I pray that it is. This heart demonstrates and produces what it, it was intended to produce. Although the others looking on just don't understand how the people with the good ground are being blessed and they are not. In each of the previous examples, there are things that each person could do to make their hearts good ground if they but will. And the promise of a return of 30, 60, and 100 fold is to all if we will prepare our hearts before him. Can you imagine? Jesus is promising us a hundred fold return in life of everything that was intended by God for you to have on this side of heaven. If we will maintain our ground, if we will maintain our heart as the Lord's good ground. In verse 21, Jesus compares the word of God to a light that regardless of where you put it, it makes manifest everything that is hidden. This is an allusion by Jesus as to why God, as the sower, is sowing the word. Uh, why would he sow the word into the wayside ground, the stony ground, the thorny ground, as well as the good ground? When the word is sown into your heart, it will bring, or it be lie, it will bring light into the character of our heart. It exposes us. In other words, whatever the word produces or does not produce, it is a commentary not on the character of the word, but on the character of the heart. It says something about the heart. The word of God is then the great discerner. Is, your, is the word working in your life? Is it producing 30, 60, or 100 fold? If it is not, what does this tell you? Oh, it's time to change churches, or time to change this, or time to change that. No, it's time to change your heart. What the word produces in your life is not commentary on the quality of the seed or even the anointing of the person sowing the word, but on the character of your own heart. You can change churches, you can change preachers, but it is the heart. So you know you need change, but it's the heart that needs to be changed. If the word is not producing, the problem is always in the heart. If you're not experiencing God's good ground, 100-fold results in your life. In verse 26, Jesus compares the word of God again in agrarian terms. He says, all you need to do is have the faith to cast your seed into the ground and go away and sleep night and day, and you will have a harvest. Did you get that? Have just enough faith to plant the seed, go to bed, and get up, and the word will work for you. Now, how is this? Verse 28 says that the earth, your heart, the human heart, will produce blade ear and full ear in the corn if you will just get the word properly, fully, and receptively planted in your heart. Did you notice what verse 28 says? It says the earth will produce. We think it is the word that produces, but that's not what Jesus says. The word activates the heart to produce what we tend to think the word should produce, but Jesus says the earth will produce the heart. The seed is nothing without the ground it is sown in. This tells us that we have vastly underestimated the power of God that lies resident in the human heart. The power to change your life and launch you into your destiny if you will just receive, cultivate, and trust in the seed of God's word that has been given to us. Thus, in Verse 33, it says Jesus spoke in many parables to the people. And in verse 34, he makes the statement that without a parable, very important, without a parable, Jesus did not speak to them. That tells us that even when we think Jesus is speaking plainly, we should ask ourselves, is there a deeper truth? Because without a parable speaking out unto them, is there a deeper truth even in the seemingly plain language statements of Christ? Afterward, Jesus instructs the disciples to go to the other side of the sea. Has he ever told you to go to the other side and didn't work out too well? They enter into the ship, but a great storm has come to the point they think they're going to die. Have you ever heard God telling you to go in a direction only to face opposition? Don't question whether it is God's will or not. 
Where is Jesus? Have you ever asked that? Where is God in all of this pressure and turbulence you're facing? Well, if you want to find out where Jesus is, go look in the bow of your boat. He's asleep. You might be rowing, but Jesus is sleeping. What's wrong with this picture? The disciples rouse Jesus and he rebukes them for not having any faith. He obviously expected them to learn the lessons of the parables that he had just spoken to them. He expected them to do what they were looking for him to bring about. Why? Because of faith. See, your faith will do for you what Jesus would do for you if he was standing right in front of you. That's why he kept telling so many people, your faith hath made you whole. That's a lesson we should all learn. Are we looking to Jesus to do what he has empowered us by his spirit, by his word, properly sown into our hearts to produce? Even so, <laughs> increase our faith, Lord Jesus. So, Father, we come to you right now. We want to be 100-fold ground. Help us to get the stones out of our ground. Help us not to be wayside hearers, casual hearers, not paying attention. Help us not to get offended in the midst of the sowing process. Help us not to be engulfed by cares of life that we're not focusing on what you're worth. Let us be good ground. Help us, Father, so that that seed of your word planted in our hearts will produce some 60, some 30, some 100 fold in Jesus' name. God bless you.